Okay. Um, I just had a senior moment, Jim Campos. <laughs> and he had his doctorate in uh, educational psychology. He's written, uh, he was a principal at a, a main elementary school in Carpinteria. He's written a couple of books, The Citrus Pearl and one other book. Uh, no, the citrus peel is actually, I was the editor of, uh, there's a, a society actually of citrus labels, that's called Citrus Label Society. Uh, it's still going, it's been going since uh, about 1981, wow. and I got to uh, edit their orderly uh, newspaper or magazine uh, for six years from, I don't remember, I guess 2006 to about 2012, something like that. Uh, so that's what the citrus peel is. Uh, but I have uh, written two books on carpentry. I co-authored. There were uh, three or four of us on each of those books, and uh, it's uh, part one, part two of carpentry history, uh, pictorially done, uh, and with uh, good text, I believe. Um, so that's what Larry was referring to. This is uh, this is my second visit to your museum, looking very nice, by the way. Thank you. Uh, it was a little more cluttered, I think, the last time I was here. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, so it is nice to see Larry and Perna again. And I learned from my experience last time how to work with Perna. So this year, all I did was bring my thumb drive and write in it. Everything's good. Uh, I, uh, how many of you were here last time that I was here? So, oh, so there are a few of you. OK. We'll, we'll, we'll kind of do a, a, a review of some questions then. And then for the rest of you, uh, well, you know, uh, it will be new stuff. Uh, I did change the. Uh, program up because I didn't want to do the same thing twice here. So uh, hopefully you'll know, see something a little differently. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, okay. Oh, and I'm sorry, <laughs> Valerie's here. Right? I always forgets oh, oh, anyways, <laughs> she's uh, yeah. Anyway, so afterwards, you know, if, you're, if you uh, have a yen to own uh, some of these labels, maybe the Ventura ones, uh, you know, there we have some things here. And we do have we don't have this one, but this is, I, I think, this is your very best label here, out of my meaning. Uh, the Oxnard Citrus Association, which I believe is, the building still out there, right? It's out there by the, by the ocean. Uh, but this was, you know, this, this is the one label that collectors really like. Somebody, and uh, this lady here was asking, do we have one of those for sale? Well, you know, that particular one is, uh, a thousand to a couple of thousand dollars because there's so few of them. There's only four or five of them in existence. And you see this one has a fold in it, uh, right there, that line. Um, and this is blown up, obviously, uh, because it was a file copy and it was kept at, uh, let's see, but the lithograph company was here in this one. No, it's not listed. Probably a Schmidt lit litho. Uh, and it was probably from the Schmidt Litho files, and it was in there, and they don't get thrown away, and so, uh, you know, that whoever made that one got it from that. And I actually have one. I'm very happy to have one that came off of the box, and uh, somebody did a real nice restoration uh, job on it. It's the real label, but it looks it looks nice, and I'm happy to have it. Um, okay, we'll we'll start the slides. Up. Where are we going to go up? The down arrow. Hmm? Oh, do I have to? Uh, down arrow. Oh, I've got to go down, of course. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So citrus box and a label, you know, kind of like what are they? Um, their era was from the 1880s to the 1950s, so a 70-year era. Uh, and their purpose was for advertising. There are many posters on a box. And uh, you know, right from the from the get-go, in the uh, after the transcontinental railroad uh, tied the United States together, um, there was you know the uh, possibility of uh, sending California oranges and lemons and grapefruits uh, eastward. And uh, the first time that that was done was in 1876. I hope I've got my my date right, uh, but a, a particular family, which we'll meet again in another slide, um, 
decided to see if, if uh, they shipped a box of oranges to St. Louis, Missouri, and they wanted to see if, if they would sell. Now, Florida was always selling their oranges, but they basically had the eastern seaboard, and that's where they would send uh, their uh, citrus. But uh, the California grower, his name is William Wolfskill, we'll meet him again in a second, uh, he was already, had already passed, but his son, Joseph, decided to see what would happen if they put ice all around the, uh, the uh, boxes and sent them off to St. Louis from Los Angeles. And so it took 30 days. I'm, was it 30 days? Uh, I get my facts mixed up sometimes. I've got to look at my printed word. But in a train from LA to St. Louis, how, how long would that have taken, do you think, for that? Maybe five days, something like that. Okay, whatever it was, they sent them off, and uh, they got to St. Louis, and the things sold quickly. <clears throat> they were gone before you knew it. They knew they had a market. And so, uh, you know, a few, about a decade later, the 1880s, about mid-1880s, uh, everybody from California that can send something is sending their labels, and of course they need to have their advertising, and that's where you get the mini posters, which we'll see a lot of. All right, so the historical significance of your labels are, they are depictions of social, technological, and advertising history and trends, and uh, Secondly, they've established an accrued value as a collectible. Um, of all the labels that you see out in the antique stores uh, or out on the fleet markets or whatever, only 5% of the labels that were made, that's our estimate, you can actually acquire. There are, we would call them common labels. Most of what you see up on the wall there uh, are in that category. There's a few up there that are, are, are a little rarer. But you can find these labels because they weren't tossed at the dump. They weren't burned, that, that kind of thing. Uh, in fact, the only reason we even have those commons today is because there were a couple of collectors in the 1960s into the 70s who decided that these things were pretty cool and they'd like to you know, grab everything they could. The uh, packing houses were still around and they had all these labels that they, that they had no use for anymore because they, you know, their usage had terminated in the 1950s. And so they're still sitting around. They haven't thrown them away. Some of them have. They've taken them to the dump. They would uh, get a pitchfork and stuff, and they toss them up, and then they burn them or whatever it was, and they, you know, they got rid of all of the labels. But um, the packing houses still had a lot of these bundles where there are 500 to 1,000 labels at a time in the bundles, sitting at the, you know, at the back of their warehouses. And these two guys, Jim Ducote and Gordon McClellan, uh, canvassed the state, went, hit every packing house. They were unbeknownst to each other doing this little uh, mission of theirs at the same time. And they never ran into each other, which was kind of curious. But they're the guys that saved all of the labels that you can actually find today. And there was one other guy Ray Marua. Does anybody know Ray? Because he's from Santa Paula. Everybody seems to know Ray, who collects labels in this area. Uh, Ray, uh, at the time, and he won't, I don't think he'll mind that I'll say this, but he used to get in trouble uh, in the 50s when he was growing up. And he ended up in uh, some sort of a juvenile you know, uh, detention thing of some kind. And uh, part of, uh, I guess, what they would have him do, part of his punishment or whatever, was that he would have to go uh, take garbage and things like that to the dump and whatever was one of his work details. And the, the packing houses uh, in uh, the Seaboard packing house particularly was sending their stuff out to be burned. And the Seaboard labels are some of the prettiest ones that you'll see. And you have some up here. You'll see Cutter up on the wall. Uh, you'll see uh, anything with the ships, galleon. Um, let's see. Yeah. Which one? Sea cured. Yeah, uh, sea bound, sea cured. All of those, all of those are coming out of that, of that, uh, of that seaboard uh, pack association. And anyways, Ray, bless his soul, as a teenager, couldn't burn them. 
He said they were too beautiful. And so instead of when they went to the dump, you know, getting the pitchfork and tossing them around and then setting them on fire, he just picked them all up and he put them into whatever you know transportation that he had, and he took them back home. And uh, a cute uh, story that he has is that his father said to him, "You know, Ray, when stuff is taken to the trash, uh, you know, to the dump, it's meant to be trash. You bring the trash back home." Well, you know, thank goodness, you know, for Ray, we still have these beautiful labels, and he. He made it a business. You know, he, uh, his stuff is still sold all over the place uh, in, in, uh, in the Ventura area. Okay, so one to the next one. Oops, are you going backwards again? Okay, some talking points just real quickly. Um, all the labels have coded messages on them, and you learn to recognize uh, how their dates, uh, you know, where they came from, all that from the messages that are on the labels. So, you know, things that you'll see uh, from the size, the size immediately tells you something. If they're 10 by 11, kind of squarish, that means they're either grapefruit or orange labels because oranges and grapefruits are bigger and they were put in boxes that were deeper. And so um, the labels then would be affixed to the uh, fruit boxes and the fruit boxes would go into the markets and people would buy from the, uh, the fruit uh, boxes. Um, and then if they're lemons, they, uh, lemons are smaller, so they were in flatter boxes. And that's why their labels are 8 and a half by 12 and a half. And then some of the other things, we'll, we'll explore them. You can kind of look at them real quickly. Fancy versus choice versus no message, sun cans, uh, blue, red, white, all this stuff. We'll look at that as we move along. Okay, and then I think this is the last of the, of the talking slides. Uh, first groves, first labels. Do any of you remember uh, William Wolfskill from the last talk? Okay, William Wolfskill is, um, uh, he was a mountain man. And, but you know, some of these mountain men were really bright guys. Uh, you take Jedediah Smith, uh, you know, who was killed. Uh, uh, but he, you know, he mapped everything out, all these passages and you know, he wrote uh, things, uh, reports, and things. Uh, a lot of these mountain men were really quite intelligent, and some of them, you know, became very, very wealthy. Um, and anyways, William Wolfskill was one of those guys. He became very wealthy. And he came to California uh, at some point, and he did what uh, a number of these guys that are on this list uh, did. Uh, they came over in the 1840s, 30s, 40s, and uh, this is Mexico. And uh, so they, maybe they fell in love, I don't know, but uh, they found Spanish uh, or Mexican women and they married them because it gave them the opportunity to buy property. You know, if you weren't a Mexican citizen, you couldn't do that. Okay, William Wolfskill marries into one of the uh, uh, Mexican households and so he can buy property. Well. He bought all of downtown LA. You go down into uh, the LA Civic area, that's all Wolfskill land. And uh, so Wolfskill went from the beaver trade, which made his first fortune, and he began to uh, uh, produce produce. And uh, he uh, put orange groves and lemon groves, and he, he did all of this stuff. He began to feed the state. Uh, the missions, of course, with all the Padres and things, uh, they started all of this first, but Wolfskill comes in and he starts taking that knowledge and he starts putting it into practice and he turns it into a commercial venture. And so he's using the ports of uh, San Pedro and, uh, and uh, San Francisco and whatever, he's moving everything you know, uh, in California. But what Wolfskill also does is he begins to sell his seedlings and things to other people who are in uh, places that you know, grow well. And so we see people like Ignacio Del Valle, who uh, uh, has the Camelos Ranch, and uh, what is that? Uh, oh, it's already left. Okay, look at it later. No, it's okay, we're, we're gonna see it in a second. But anyways, he begins to also grow uh, his orange groves and things of that nature. Shepherd, uh, who comes uh, from San Montecito, he's also connected to Wolfskill. 
He does the same thing as Will Skill. He marries into a, a Spanish-speaking family in order to get his land out in Montecito. Um, then later you get Blanchard, who's very, very big for Santa Paula. And uh, we'll meet him as we move along too. And the Ojai Independent Growers and Fillmore and all those areas. Yeah. Okay, let's see. And we'll come back to Wolfsco again because he keeps popping up. Okay, here's our first look at a label. And I'm really not sure what this is. Um, selected Santa Paula lemons. Uh, very, very early. And I'm not sure if this was just on a piece of paper that they slapped onto a box and they moved, you know, uh, by the, the spurs and the little railroad uh, lines that they had to, to take their, uh, their, uh, pro their uh, products out, or if it was stenciled onto a box, which could have been, because the very first boxes that had the fruit were stenciled in. So that could have been this. And then look at the next one. Okay, this time, it's a little different, you know. Was that also paper and uh, glued on? It's hard to tell, but you notice that it's circular. Um, the very, very first labels were actually circular. And they were quite small, um, just about like this. And so, uh, you know, you have the box, and they would just kind of put them right in the middle of the box. Uh, that did not last very long. Uh, all the standardiz uh, standardization of the, labors, of the labels came almost immediately. So there are very, very few circular ones out there. I own one, uh, and there's one particular collector who has maybe a dozen or so. But that might be about all there is of the circular ones. Now here, this is what we more imagine what a label is going to look like. These are among the very, very first. These are oversizes. You can almost see that, can't you? Even though they're, uh, you know, they're, they're just up on a picture, because the standardization is going to be like this. But and this is your ten and a half by eleven and a half. But these you can tell are bigger. And that's what they were. The other thing about these two labels, and these are, uh, you know, from the area, is that uh, they have a waxier uh, look to them. The very first ones that were oversized like this had waxier uh, lithography, lithographical process to them. And, uh, you know, I, I, I should maybe have brought examples of those, but these are really, really old. This, this is, uh, you know, 1880s, 1890s stuff. Um, and it's kind of cool is that I'm going to guess that maybe the Santa Barbara and Ventura County one uh, is the... Uh, earliest one, uh, because Ventura County was in Santa Barbara County. And, and uh, what is the year, 1874? Is that when it split? I, is, am I right? I think so. Okay, so in 1874 probably, uh, Santa Barbara and Ventura were split into two. And can one of you guys tell me, San Fernando, was that also a part of this large county that San Fernando went over to LA? No, I, don't, I, don't so. I, I, don't, I don't know that, except that San Fernando is very much connected to the Ventura Labels. So th there's some sort of a connection with that. Or the railroad tracks. Uh, okay. okay, and then the other one, which is another candidate for the very first label in this area, is the uh, Topa Topa Ranch, which made uh, that label in Ohio. And that's a real, that's a real, real, real one. Now, we were talking about the home of Ramona. The, and there's, yeah. She's, so uh, this is just one of the outstanding labels. And I think I already mentioned that it was like a $200 label. And then a big find was made. And so it has uh, really shot down the price. And everybody can afford one now. But this is a 1900s label. And it has a gold leaf uh, border all around it. It, it is spectacular. Um, so 1900s label, the gold leaf, it's uh, UF Del Valle, who, is, who started the, uh, the ranching uh, and, and selling oranges commercially in the 1850s. Um, and it's from Cabalos, the ranch. Uh, it was found in bundles on that date that you see, after that date, January 17, 1994. The, North, uh, the Northridge earthquake hit, and the owner 
of the Camelos Ranch got spooked by the earthquake. He didn't like earthquakes. And so he moved to Las Vegas. He moved out of California and sold the ranch. He obviously had a bunch of bundles of Homo Gorgonas that nobody knew about, and he took them with him to Las Vegas. And then shortly after that, he probably had them stored somewhere and then, you know, forgotten they were there. And uh, shortly after he moved to Las Vegas, he began to sell all of his bundles to dealers. And suddenly, the area gets flooded. Yeah. You know, it's like, where, you know, where are these coming from? And this is what happened. And so they are now a common label. And maybe, you know, they would sell for $10, but it's pretty rough, I mean, to see a label that gorgeous, you know, for that low a price. And so we tend to sell them for $20, and we still think that's still a good deal. They're just too, too nice to look at. Yeah, yeah, we'll come to that. Um, the very first home of the Ramona looks very similar to, the, to this one from the 1900s. This one, I'm going to guess, is maybe 1890s. And you can see the difference, uh, a, li a little bit of a difference. It's the same thing, but it says fancy California oranges. And that's one of your coding uh, things there. Fancy was the highest level of quality in the very early times. That's how they would tell you if you were getting the best quality uh, orange or lemon. It was a fancy one. And then, in about 19, 10, 11, 12, something like that, um, the Cambalos Ranch uh, sold their image, which was so popular, to the uh, Pyru uh, Citrus Association. And that's why these now are homeroronas from Pyru. And these are truly rare. All the Pyru homeroronas are near impossible to find. Oh, and, you, and right here, Again, coating. You see the uh, sun-kissed orange, the sun-kissed yellow ball, all these. That's telling you, again, top quality. If it's sun-kissed, it's top quality. Fancy versus choice. There's another fancy one. This one is a real rare uh, label, and it's coming out of El Montecito. So obviously Montecito at one time was called El Montecito. And uh, I keep this one, and I always show it at talks that I do, because it, it has such a great history on it. Uh, you see two little boys that are in front of what looks to be like a packing house. This was a packing house. It was uh, on, what's that road? East, East Valley Road in Montecito. And it's not very far from Mount Carmel Church. Everybody knows Mount Carmel Church. Uh, and notice that the label is called Carmelica, Carmel. It was also a church. It was packing house, it doubled as a church, and it tripled as the school building. So it had multi-purposes, this building. And it finally burned down in about in the early 1900s, I believe. Uh, and obviously, it was the first Mount Carmel church. So, and it, it's not very far from the one uh, that is now there. I think it was on the other side of the street. That's the street. Yeah. yeah. And then here now you see a fancy one. I uh, mean, yeah, choice. Choice was the second grade. So fancy top, choice was in the middle. And to me, this is such an anomaly because of the representation. It looks very much like a label that would have been one of the last ones in the 40s or 50s. Because by that time, they'd gone almost completely to doing graphic in, uh, art, graphic lettering on the, uh, on the uh, labels. And you no longer saw the, the beautiful pictures, you know, like, well, that's not one, but like these, you know. So uh, anyway, it's very interesting to me that they did it that way. It, you could say in, in one sense that it was really ahead of its time because the advertising, it took it 40 or 50 years more to look like that. But there's one from the early period. And then this one has no designation. I'm not sure if that's significant or not. But typically, if they had no designation on them, whether they were fancy or choice, that meant that they were the poorest grade of the label. And so typically, what I've learned is that a lot of the uh, 
worst quality fruit. And the, the fruit actually inside was fine. But they were typically, it was fruit that was marred in some way. It was defaced in some way and it didn't look as appealing. But, you know, the fruit on the very inside was probably just as good. Uh, and so they were typically, it seems to me, some of the images on the on the lower quality fruit are some of the best images. And I'll show you in a bit. Well, because they, you know, if you walk into a store and you see this box and it has this beautiful image, you might just, you know, pick that particular piece of fruit. Does anybody recognize that? That's a picture from Santa Barbara. That is a picture of the flower, in the flower festival in Santa Barbara, which ran during the 1890s for about a six year period. Uh, and it competed against the Rose Bowl. But of course the Rose Bowl became, you know, this very iconic thing that is very related to California. And the, uh, the flower festival did not. And so after about six years, they killed the festival. And probably they couldn't compete with the Rose Bowl, so they quit. But this picture right here is coming off of Cabrillo Street, do you know Cabrillo Street, where the harbor is at and all that yeah. And when they do the Fiesta Parade, which came in the 1920s, uh, it always starts in, on Cabrillo and it goes up State Street. And I'm sure all of you have been in up State Street. And anyways, there you are. So it's right there at the pier. Yeah, it's right there at the pier. It, exactly. Going up. You know what I mean? Excuse my, my infrared pointer. That's why I bring it. Okay. All right, here's some early Limonetta labels, and again, you can see the beauty. And uh, the early labels have the best images. Why? Because they were slapped onto the box, and every time somebody came in to the supermarket, not supermarket, the local market, you know, they would see the fruit boxes with these beautiful images, and that's how they would advertise and sell their fruit. This one right here, you can see the actual original Limonera packing house, which is still there, it's been upgraded. And the original Rio Whale, uh, the later versions of the Rio Whale, um, you can find and you can own one of those. We have a few of the later ones here. Um, but this one, they, you know, they really do have a scene out of, uh, out of Yosemite there. That's a gorgeous, gorgeous label. That's Bradley Old Falls. Yeah. It's actually the thesis. Yeah. And then, by 1907, the, the uh, California Fruit Growers Association, which was the, uh, the association which helped all of the growers and they would provide them their boxes and uh, they uh, helped them with the litho companies that would make their images and all that. Anyways, by 1907, the Fruit Growers uh, Fruit Association developed these logos, which became, for that company, their way to tell you the quality of the fruit. So you see that selected Santa Paula, which you saw at the very beginning, which was just that, you know, uh, it's not a very pretty piece of paper, and now it's looking pretty nice, and they're calling this the selected uh, lemons, and there's their um, logo, and they call this a sunburst, sunkiss logo. This one over here is the red ball, and the red ball was their second quality uh, fruit. So if you ever see a red ball, you're looking at something that was the second tier. And in my hometown, Carpinteria, you see a combination of uh, the, the uh, Fruit Growers Association with the Sunkist, and now they've got it in a you know wrap, a lemon wrap there. But there's another thing going on here. So this is top quality, but it's also using the county fair designation. So blue ribbon is your top quality uh, at the county fair. So the blue is telling you that that's top quality. And then the smile is telling you that it's kind of like the red ball. It's red ribbon and it's second quality. 
This right here, in 1912, the guy that's on this, uh, C.D. Hubbard, he came to Carpinteria and he stopped from the San Fernando Valley and he uh, started the uh, Hubbard uh, Fruit Company. And he used happy, smile, and then his lowest quality fruit was joy. And I thought, how, how, you know, how brilliant. I mean, this guy was already thinking in, in really good branding terms. So happy, smile, sad. I thought, not sad, joy. <laughs> happy, smile, joy. And so you are going to have one of those emotions if you bought his, his, uh, his, his product. But look what happened. Uh, very soon in the game, the Joy label, I, I collect Carpentry labels. I have a very good collection. I do not have a Joy. I have never seen a Joy label. And that's because Hubbard did, oops, did this. He dropped the Joy label and he changed it with the champ. And he took his son, Lester. This is a picture, uh, probably from 1904, I believe, uh, of Lester. And this label comes in around the 20s, 1920s. But he put Lester with a little ball and a dog. And this is probably the top label out of Carpinteria for collectors. It's real rare. And just like your Seaside, it's one of those labels as a grand or two grand, if you can find it. Um, the thing about, oh, Champ, uh, as you can see, is uh, a beautiful, beautiful label. So that's carrying the lower quality fruit. They drop the joy, but they give you this really great image to entice you to buy the, the fruit. Uh, huh? and, oh, yeah. And there's another thing, you know, the no designation, which is the lowest quality. In the county fair, it should be white, shouldn't it? Third prize is white. White does not translate well to these labels, so they wouldn't use white as a background. What they did instead was they chose the colors yellow and green to use as that um, as that uh, designation. And Hubbard, you know, was was again a good marketing guy. He borders it in green and he uses yellow on the inside. He used both colors. Mm -hmm. and, and so, uh, oh, and I, and I, before I move to the next, I got this guy, Lester, became kind of a, a funny legend in Carpinteria because he was as wild as you could be. Uh, in the 1920s, when this label comes out, Lester was already in his prime, and uh, he was a bootlegger, you know, during uh, the Prohibition era. Uh, he loved to run in a fast crowd. Uh, he would, he was uh, constantly in Hollywood, and he would bring starlets and things down into Carpinteria. And so, uh, and he drove the uh, latest cars. He he liked he liked to drive fast. He liked uh, the ladies. He liked his liquor. And uh, anyways, he and he was just uh, what's the right word? About it? He was nonconformist, <laughs> nonconformist, unique, and he was always trying to cause trouble. <laughs> so this cherubic, lucky little guy, you know, was anything but. And, you know, when he passed away in the 70s, okay, by the 1960s, he's an old man. You know, so he's not this guy that's right around, you know, Devin or whatever. And he's basically, he has squandered the family wealth. So he's, he's almost destitute. Uh, he still owns one of the family's homes. And he lived not very far from where we live. Uh, and he put up, in front of his house, he put up a big blanket, a big sheet, sheet yeah. uh, basically to, so you couldn't look into his house. But on the sheet, he wrote, stud fee, one dollar. <laughs> I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't know if anybody That's so ever. Typical. Yeah, very typical of Lester. And, and uh, he used to hang around with the hippie crowd, with all the young people in the 60s. And uh, he always wore this red, I think it was red, it's some beret they had on. And his hair was white, long, and stringy. And he had a beard that was also stringy. He never wore a shirt, not even a t-shirt. He was always bare-chested. 
Uh, he had a little Volkswagen, which was a convertible, or did he just rip the top off? And, and, and so anyways, you can always tell when Lester was coming in that little bug, you know, with, it, with no top and him bare chest. No matter what the weather. Yeah, no matter the weather. <laughs> anyway, it's interesting. <laughs> anyways, here you see a later version of the red, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the blue, red, and green. So again, you've got the blue ribbon, red ribbon, no white, but yellow or green. Okay, and then by the 1940s, late 30s, 40s, everything is becoming graphic designs. You're not seeing the beautiful images. So you have an airline that uh, is from the 1940s. Yeah, so we'll do, oops. And then, I just wanted to show this. These are 1900s labels. The uh, Santa Paula Citrus Fruit Association um, started about 1902 or three, something like that. And they always had them in this way. So again, maybe they were just far-sighted and they knew it was going to go to this. But by the 1940s, you know, they are still using the very same uh, images uh, and their and the graphic design, graphic layering. Can you date these? And just look at those. OK, you know the 40s. And look at that one that says Airlane. I, we think that might be a misprint. They, somebody makes 78 with the eye because uh, that's the only one we know of. I mean, we've only seen one of that label, air, air lease. But, yeah, it's a temporary label, right? Uh, and then the airline, which is the early version, this is from the 1920s. This is uh, actually a design that uses what they call aluminum filter uh, lithography, and it was used during the 20s, and it replaced the stone litho process. And the stone litho process is definitely the best process. It is just more expensive to use. But the prettiest labels are all stone lithos. And so, you know, they, they've got a, a, just a really unique look to them. And some of these labels, like Albion here, they continue to use. They did not throw away the stones which uh, would run uh, these labels through. Uh, Bronco is another label. I'm not sure if I have a right here. I know we've got one someplace. No. We could, we got a Bronco somewhere in there. And you've got one up here. Uh, but anyways, that also, they kept using the stone little process all the way up to the 1950s. It was amazing that they kept using them. They didn't. Because the stone lentils also, at a certain point, they would have to kind of erase the stones when they wanted to use new labels. So once they erased them, you were never going to see that label again. You know, so for a Bronco or for this Albion to keep going is that somebody like thought so much of these labels that they just did not, you know, uh, smooth out the stones to build something new. Is everybody happy? <laughs> this is what this is what happens to us collectors is that when um, they keep updating the labels from you know. Every five years or whatever we do, um, for us collectors, we gotta have every single one of them because they all look the same basically. But every one of those is a different time period, and we even have in Carpinteria a great group. I'm told that in Carpinteria, my hometown, uh, that they used to have oranges too, but I've never seen an orange label out of Carpinteria. That's amazing. And and you, I think maybe you know, but. Lemon labels, uh, need, uh, rather lemons, need to be grown closer to the ocean for the, to get the salty breezes and stuff like that. And so your oranges are all coming from the foothills. You know, so that's that's the difference. And then in uh, in Ventura County, you have, you have similar stuff. You know, like the stripes out of Fillmore, which is kind of interesting. And Rancho Zesty. Uh, and for a while, you know, people. Uh, we're trying to figure out how many different colors uh, they actually use for the stripes. The silver one over here is actually pink in the middle here. And the one that is actually silver is really hard to find, but there is one. And then, here we got a white. You never see this. We actually have a white stripe. So, of course, it's bordered in blue or black there, but there's a white one. 
And, uh, and then here's, you know, we can see, these are all lemons. And there's our orange one. And all the colors run with these too. The, the orange ones are a lot harder. They're all hard to find, but the orange is particularly for, the, uh, for this particular brand. Okay, in uh, Santa Paula, T and McKevitt, who were partners with Blanchard, who were doing the Limonera packing house, um, somehow both Blanchard and a lot of the guys that were part of Limonera would have their own, uh, I forget, I don't know, their own packing houses or something. But Pete Tiggin and McKevitt simultaneously are sending uh, fruit out of these um, brands, just the way Blanchard also was doing it, his own uh, uh, brands with Blanchard rather than Limonetta. But here, this is really interesting because Tiggin McKevitt used all uh, Mason symbols for their label. So they had a theme on them, you know, the golden bowl, picture, the level, the compass, and uh, some sort of a book. Very, very interesting, I think. And then they had one, which is very elusive, um, the Fountain brand. Uh, I'm real fortunate to have both of these particular labels. They're the only ones I've ever seen. Uh, but again, it has of the, the Mason and the Sonic theme to it. But one of the reasons that you do not see this particular label is because they changed it. They changed it to a mission kind of a thing. And that one you've probably seen. So that, they replaced Fountain with a, it looks more like a Santa Barbara label. Okay, here's another one where they took a theme. And this is Santa Paula Orange Association. And they went with the Great Depression and they used exotic animals, but they titled each one of their labels with some sort of a message to, that we can get through the Great Depression. We've got to have courage. We must be stalwart. We must have strength. We will endure. Okay. So that was kind of neat. Then, who knows why they did this? <laughs> you know, what, what message were they trying to get? You know? uh, yeah, I mean, we know what they were trying to do here. Why did they do this? Stick your head in the sand and it'll be all over. <laughs> I like that one. Okay, then uh, Fillmore was real good uh, with some of their labels in you know showing progress in technology. So the uh, the very first label uh, of this series is your uh, Zeppelin or balloon or whatever, and uh, that's a really expensive label. I don't, you can find one of those they typically you know, sell for five, six thousand uh, dollars. But I actually think that the second of these labels, it looks like my pointer's not working for that. Uh, yes. Any questions, Amy? No, sure. it's working. Yeah, okay. Uh, you see it's a biplane. And this I think is really the rarest one of this group. I have not seen you know more than one or two of these. You, you see more of these, but these are real expensive. And then uh, they went to a single wing plane. And then the final version was this one, where they went to a jet. And uh, that one you'll find. An airship is, is always one of their top quality. Then another theme was the, uh, the ships and things. And these are all, uh, with, the, with the exception of the silver craft, these are all the labels that Ray Maru from Santa Paula saved. The only one that is really rare is the yacht. And um, I've only seen one or two of those. So I wonder if that escaped Ray, or if maybe that was the first one he burned, and then after that, he said, I can't burn these. And he began to save them all. Okay, and then in, during World War II, they started using the pinup art on some of the labels. And uh, what, is, what is this one? The Ventura Pacific Company? They used to be right off the freeway. But the Pacific made just one of the really, I think, great labels. 
of uh, an example of pen apart that goes with World War II. And then, a common occurrence, but not a label. You know, I challenge you to find any other label outside of seaside that, and in the citrus variety, uh, that shows a depiction of people enjoying themselves at the beach. I mean, what is more California than a day at the beach? And yet, you know, they did not have labels that showed people enjoying themselves at the beach. And just about everything under the sun has been put on a label, you know, artistically. But again, just these two. And the, the one on the right is the 1920s version of the seaside. And then the one on the left is closer to the 1940s. And you find very few, very, very few labels that uh, are ex as expensive as the seaside for a 1940s label. You know, that's 1,000, 2,000. Know, by the 1940s, you just do not see that kind of a price on a label. <laughs> But you know, if you look at this, if you can get it real close to like this one here, you see, you see that they've got a mission in the background. And I don't know if that's Pacific Ocean Park going all the way out to Santa Monica or something. <laughs> but you know, there's some interesting things on this particular label. Oops, what did I do? Oops. I didn't want to do that. Oh, here we are. We're back. Okay. And then uh, mountain scenes, all of these from the uh, Fillmore and Santa Paula area. Early days of uh, the Ventura area. And all, all of these are from your area here. These are all coming out of the Oxnard Citrus Association, which is somewhere near here. This one right here in the middle, Oxnard, uh, this actually is not a common label. The common one looks like this, but this one was obviously made at Christmas time. And uh, there, so there's a wreath back there. And so that makes it a little different. And I'm, I'm not sure if on this particular slideshow. Yeah, I do. I, I'm going to, I will talk about the devil. The, uh, desirability of the orange during Christmas time. And that's, okay. so, let's see. Okay, Plains Indians, who knows why? Because these are not California Indians, uh, shouldn't use that word, Native Americans. Uh, but these were common in uh, the Ventura area. Mansions, all, the two at the top, that mansion that you see up there is still there. It's up a road near Fillmore. Okay. Huh? Oh, by Pyro. Yeah. And then the one on the bottom is somewhere from LA, but I put it there because it looks so similar to the house on the uh, Pyro uh, mansion. But obviously somebody else had the same idea. And then where have all the flowers gone? It's amazing to me. Flowers are one of the most common themes on labels. And yet, in Ventura, there's only one, and it's this one, one sets. What's that? You don't, you don't think it's a very good rendering? I was an art teacher. Yeah. I'm saying it's not uh, the point set of that I think. <laughs> okay. Perhaps as the leaves start to fall off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Here, you know, we have an Ajax label and a Centauria label. And these are on what they call stock labels. If, uh, if one of the uh, associations or the growers ran out of their labels and they needed a label fast, they would uh, go to Schmidt Litho or Western or one of the lithography com uh, companies and they would ask for a replacement until uh, somebody had the time to go and make their beautiful labels and they'd be resupplied. So in the meantime, they would buy these stock images. And so they would just uh, slap on the title at the top, Ajax, or put Centauri right in the middle. And they would send these out so they could keep selling their fruit. Uh, but obviously, if 
we could ever find an actual Ajax label, it would probably have, you know, a warrior from the Greek Trojan War or something on it. But I've never seen that. I don't know why you would take a stock label and put Ajax on it. And then the same thing with Centauria. And I'll show you the next label. Right, there it again. Wrong button. There's Argus, you know, which refers to uh, the all-seeing eye, and it looks like also maybe to Argo, uh, the ship, and the Argonauts and all that. I'm not sure. But Argus was a symbol of a, a watchful guardian in mythology. Oh, but, you know, that answers the question. That's why Jason and the Argonauts were on the Argo boat. Argo is referring to the watchful eye. Okay. We we're, were having this discussion the other day. So, anyways. Uh, so there, you know, you have the actual image of the of a, of a mythological term. And then here's just gorgeous from Fillmore. I think Fillmore was the absolute best at uh, you know, coming up with their art. So. Now, I have a very, very strong Ventura collection. I think our, our most valued collections for Valerie and I are the Ventura collection and our Santa Barbara collection. If I, we're fortunate that we have the Cupid and we have the Oriole, but we don't have this one, which is very, very expensive, and we don't have this one. They're very rare, they're very expensive. So if I could actually find those two, it would pretty much complete our collection. If we can afford them too, that's the other thing. You're willing to shell out the coin. Okay, we talked about William Wolf's skill few times. Here was another one of his fortunes. During the gold rush, and we have you know, this miner here with a big hit. During the gold rush, the uh, miners suffered from scurvy, just like the uh, sailors coming across uh, from you know, the times of, uh, of the great discoveries uh, needed some sort of fruit you know, to stay healthy. They had the same issue in the gold fields. So what Wolfskill did was he picked up lemons. I'm not sure why he picked lemons rather than, than oranges, because I would imagine oranges do the same thing. But he sent boxes of, of lemons uh, to San Francisco to the port, and they were you know, brought up towards Sacramento. And he started selling his lemons at a dollar a piece. Now, when we were young, I mean, I think lemons, they almost gave them away. And uh, today, according to my daughter, you can still get a lemon for about 43 cents or something individually. But he was selling them at a dollar because they were needed. They were, uh, and they were willing to pay a dollar to keep well. He also sold, or maybe was a, a merchant, they would take the lemons and squeeze them into little vials. And so you could either buy a lemon or buy the vial. And I think they each were priced about the same for a dollar. And it kept you healthy. And you have to imagine that they made a lot of money by uh, taking advantage of the situation. Okay, the, here's what I'm saying. The orange uh, was an, initially a delicacy food, and it was meant to be eaten. You did not drink orange juice. You peeled it, and you ate it. That's the way oranges were done. And uh, so the uh, oranges sold prior to World War I uh, were delicacy items. And they became a tradition throughout the Midwest. I don't know if it went all the way to the East, but I know that in Oklahoma, Nebraska, and those states, the orange under the Christmas tree was a traditional you know, thing. And uh, so I have a, an eyewitness account. Uh, Clarence Peterson, uh, who's a friend of ours, he just passed away about a year or two. But he told me stories of the tradition of oranges in Nebraska. They came from Nebraska, I believe. That the family, they, and they weren't real uh, wealthy, but they would go to a particular town uh, where there would be a Christmas celebration. And they would get in their buckboard and pack up the whole family, and they'd go, and it would be icy and the whole thing. They would get there. And part of the Christmas services was to give each child an orange. And so it was a, like a present for Christmas. And he says that they, had a, they did not want to eat their oranges. 
because they smelled so good. And so they would delay eating their Christmas oranges. And they would uh, uh, leave them under their Christmas trees or whatever. And they would cuddle them and smell them and maybe peel them just a little bit. Uh, and he says, finally, he said our mother would say, you better eat those. And so they would finally peel them and then they would eat their Christmas orange. And of course, they would then take the, the peel or whatever, they would use it for their jellies and whatever else that they, that they used. So anyway, so that was that story about the orange. Now, in the 19, 14, 15, 16 time, just prior to World War I, the, uh, the uh, orange companies like Mutual Orange Distributors and the California Fruit Growers Association, which had Sunkist, they decided they needed to come up with new ways to sell the product. And so they thought, well, let's train people to drink oranges. And it sounds funny today to think that they hadn't thought that you could drink an orange. But they started their Drink an Orange campaign. And uh, so they began to produce things like these juicers and things of that nature. And they uh, began to give them away to the public. Because it takes more oranges to make a pitcher of orange juice, they would sell more oranges. So if you went and bought an orange, you would typically get a coupon or something in your wrap. Because when they would buy their oranges out of the box, it wasn't just the label on the front, but there would, they would be wrapped. And often, the wraps had little pictures and things, too. They were just as colorful as the labels. And if you collected the wraps, then you know, take your orange, use it, collect your wrap, put it aside. And then if you reach 20, 30, 50, whatever, however many wraps it took, sent them to the Sunkist organization of mutual orange distributors, and they would send you back a juicer. Or you might even be able to collect your, uh, your, your silver, your spoons, your forks, your knives. Uh, those wraps were all used in that way. And so, uh, anyways, they began to train people to drink oranges. And I think the next, no, no, something else here. Okay, in Camarillo, they actually used their labels then to begin to uh, promote the healthful aspects of eating fruit. So their series has starts with the baby, it goes to a, a younger child, it goes to a very healthy tennis player, and uh, then ends with an older gentleman. You know, that was their theme. And vitamin C does not get officially labeled as vitamin C until the 1930s. But in the 20s, they already could see that there were healthful aspects to uh, citrus. And so they were the whole label field began to drift and began to show these kinds of depictions of using uh, oranges, lemons, and grapefruit for health. And then look at this next one, one of my favorite labels. I'll drink to that. Cheers. <laughs> and, and my daughter, she was she was at the home yesterday, and we were having some discussions of this as we were preparing for this uh, talk. Uh, she said, "Well, that's a way to get somebody who doesn't eat healthy to eat a nice healthy orange. This is for the unhealthy people." <laughs> so who knows? But I thought that was a cute. <laughs> Two ways, you know, to, to define that. Of course, it also. She says, "I wonder if they were what they were putting in that glass of orange juice." <laughs> and of course, they're using that as a kind of a sexy thing before bedtime. Uh, hey, one of my favorite labels. Smoking jacket. A smoking jacket, right? Okay. Then I'm almost done here. Um, here are a bunch of labels that look like they're stock labels. Each one of these labels, the original depictions, which are real hard to find, uh, therefore I don't have them, otherwise I'd show them to you. But power was actually a locomotive, a very strong locomotive when it went across. And so was transit. Um, so I wish, I'd love to have those labels, but I don't have them. And then I don't know what they have on Ventura. Maybe it was always just like that. But I, I have a feeling all of these had earlier versions that had some sort of image. And then just some great images that you can see. 
some from Pyru there, Ventura, one from Vilma. Right, great right, looking. And then these, of course, are earlier later. And then some Oh, hi, beauties. And then Santa Paula. <laughs> and then this is the last little series, and we'll finish up. In the night, late 40s, early 50s, the highway system is getting put in. And so all of a sudden, you know, uh, this company, Santa Clara Lemon Association, decides they're going to use the highway theme for their labels. So here we see the whole set. And right there, in the middle there, there's a stock label. And I've never seen what the center lane image looks like. There must be one that looks like, like these. And there's your point of view right there in the middle. And the 1950s, with the freeway system, begins to open, you know, to shut down the local markets because now people can drive out to their supermarkets and stuff like that. And that signals the demise of the labels. Now, they had, from the onset of World War I, they already had the technology to do away with the fruit box. And especially during wartime, they, would, they needed all the supplies, like the wood and the metal and all that, and they would collect the stuff. And, uh, but the growers liked their labels so much that they would not abandon wood. They could have gone to cardboard as early as World War I, but they did not. And that was a conscious decision. World War II, they did not. But by the time of the, of the freeways and all that, and the supermarkets, it's finally time. And people are also beginning to buy fruit in quantity. And so the cardboard box, you're not picking out of a cardboard box. You're buying the cardboard box and you're taking it home. Or you're buying it in one of those screen bags and you're taking it home. So that is what uh, you know, caused the end of the label designs. And so by the mid-1950s, it's over. And you don't have the labels. And that's our uh, yeah. uh, This is a sample now. Thank you. So if you have any questions, yeah. I don't have a question. Yeah. Speaking of more music, Christmas, I can remember.